Geeks and geek ads, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, all of my rowdy, nerdy comic book compadres, welcome to another edition of Ask Chuck Dixon, where you, the common folks, <laughs> get to ask me, a uh, writer of world renown, questions about what I do for a living. And what I do for a living is I, I sit here every day and, and make stuff up. I just write comic books. So, uh, hey, if you like what you see, please subscribe. Subscriptions have helped. They've helped the channel grow immensely since I've started asking you and reminding you to subscribe. So if you haven't already, do it. Uh, if you have, thank you. And let's get right to the questions. Paul Manoia, um, your take on the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, the Wildstorm comics, is as good, if not better, than most of its film sequels. Well, thank you. Thank you. That is a very kind thing to say. Are there any other slasher franchises you'd love to take a stab at? Sorry for the pun, but I've been reading lots of EC comics lately. Well, you are forgiven. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, I'm not a big fan of the slasher genre. Uh, um Texas Chainsaw Massacre just seems like misery porn to me. Uh, Friday the 13th just seems dumb. Uh, <laughs> Scream, on the other hand, is basically just a whodunit mystery uh, dialed up as a, a slasher film. Uh, so that kind of interests me because uh, each entry in the Scream franchise, because in the previous film, the murderer died, uh, each each new entry in the franchise has to introduce a new murderer with new motives, uh, still wearing the same mask and all that, and and still using a knife. But um, you know, it's it's a whole new story, which I think is the reason why the franchise goes on and on and on because you're constantly introducing new characters, new situations. And, you know, sometimes they go back to the recurring characters from before, but it's it's always a brand new mystery. It's always a brand new set of motives. And circumstances. Uh, so it, it would be interesting because uh, a good mystery that works um, is a challenge. And I like a challenge now and again. Uh, unfortunately, you know, my favorite slasher films are um, one-offs. Uh, Your Next is, I think, the best one ever made. Uh, it's not only a great slasher film, it's a, um, it's a great you-don't-know-who-you're-messing-with film. Uh, and, and I like it a lot. If you haven't seen it, it's very stylish, uh, just, just extremely well done uh, and suspenseful and keeps you guessing right to the end. And it is, it is, it is like the Scream franchise, a whodunit mystery as well. Now, generally in the horror realm, uh, boy, I'd, I'd, I'd love to do a comic set in the Conjuring universe. Uh, I, I really, really like the Conjuring movies as, as millions of others do. And uh, I think it's a rich universe. Uh, very, it's got a lot of depth there. And um, you know, as I've said many times before, I like horror stories in which uh, Jesus wins in the end. So uh, this would be a good fit for me. So uh, if you're uh, in control of the comic book rights and <laughs> conjuring universe, and you can match my page rate, get a hold of me here. <laughs> okay. John Morgan Bat Neal, who uh, will not mix with the Hoy Ploy and sent his questions to Bruno Bookstore at gmail.com, uh, reached out to me uh, on um, direct messaging with this question. You recently discussed some current Westerns. I'd like to hear your thoughts about some current war movies such as Fury, 1917, Dunkirk, Midway, Sisu, Heartbreak Ridge, I think you mean... Hacksaw Ridge, and et al. Okay, uh, let's start with Fury. I really like Fury. Uh, a lot of people say it was it's too bleak. Uh, <laughs> our troops didn't do things like that. Uh, you're wrong. Uh, first of all, it's bleak because it's um, you know it's 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 the fight into Germany at the close of World War II. Uh, you know, World War II, an absolute horrific event. That, that marks our lives right up until today. Uh, we are living in a post-World War II era. I know you think you're living in the era of Twitter and Google and all the rest of it, 
But if you look at the United States economy and how our government runs things and how they spend money, we're in a post-World War II economy, my friends, and we've never gotten out of it. Uh, you are living in a post-World War II age. Um, but Fury presents uh, a bleak image of a bleak time. Uh, the, uh, you know, American uh, or allied invasion of Germany. And uh, a lot of people take issue with the scene in which um, they simply kill a German prisoner, unarmed German prisoner. Uh, I, I happen to have known two different World War II vets who killed unarmed German prisoners uh, on orders. And uh, one of them was perfectly fine with it, as far as I could tell. The other was disturbed by what he had had to do until his dying day. Uh, so it did happen. And I've, I've read many, many accounts of um, the particularly SS troops being summarily executed by American troops. Uh, but it's an excellent film. And it's a, as far as a, a shoot 'em up, if you want to see a lot of Nazis get off, uh, other than Dirty Dozen, this is the one to go to. Oh, um, Hacksaw Ridge, I really liked. I mean, it's Mel Gibson. Uh, in my mind, Mel Gibson can do no wrong. Uh, it's a terrific story. It takes you through a lot of emotional catharsis. Uh, the choice to make a movie about a heroic, conscientious objector is a bold one. But Mel is always up to a bold challenge in a film. And, uh, you know, the, the, the stuff he puts this character through in order to make us relate to them and understand uh, their rather sophisticated worldview, uh, which seems contradictory at first, but, but through action, and when this lead character gets tested, we see that he is a man of his own convictions. He is a, he is a hero in his own right. And um, what's really amazing about this film, it's a, you know, it's an action-packed war film as well as a, a touching human drama. What's really amazing is is what Mel was able to accomplish on a shoestring budget. I believe this movie had a budget of $19 million. And when you see the film, it's like, get out of here. <laughs> There's no way he made it for that amount of money. But um, uh, Mel Gibson is a master film craftsman, and he knows how to put every dollar up on the screen because he so often uh, financed his own production. So he knows how to... Uh, how to uh, squeeze a buck to make a film look good. 1917 uh, gets a lot of acclaim. Um, I don't care for it. I, I, I think that the gimmick, the continuous shot gimmick, takes a lot away from the movie uh, because you're you're never you're, you're never unconscious of what the director is doing. Um, you know, there's different ways to film. You know. Hitchcock films his movies as if the camera were a character. In other words, you are the, you are a character in a movie. You are observing, and the and the, and the camera is your stand-in. Um, director Sam Mendes takes this to another level with the continuous shots. And and the thing is that this is a this is a gimmick that failed for Hitchcock. Hitchcock made a movie in continuous shot, one continuous shot, um, called Rope. And it's one of his weakest efforts uh, and really doesn't work uh, when you see it. You can watch it as a curiosity, but you never become fully engaged in the story. And this is that. And this one's Rope was a, a suspense film, just a, a thriller. This is a film dealing with a far more serious subject matter. And um, I just, it just seemed like one damn thing after another. I, I it, it almost seems like in the last third of the film, as if they, they, they knew they'd run out of story and they really didn't know what else to do. So they just sort of, you know, meandered around for a while. A far better film, recent film, uh, based in World War I is uh, All Quiet on the Western Front, which is a, a German production uh, done through Netflix. And it's a terrific adaptation of the novel. And the, and the changes it makes from the novel to film are entirely excusable because, you know, they're trying to make a film. So it gets across the feel of the novel, but it changes a number of things about it in order to make it work as a movie. But as a, as a war movie, it is simply a harrowing 
portrayal of life in the trenches. It's just brutal. Don't look away. This is not an adventure film. This is an anti-war film. And as I've said many, many times, any good war film is an anti-war film because no one likes war. Uh, but we want to see war films because we want to see the extremes of the human condition, the best of man and the worst of man. And All Quiet on the Western Front, this most recent version, really brings that out. Uh, Midway, I did not see largely because of the trailers. It just looked like a CGI mess to me. And it didn't accurately portray. I've done a lot of reading on the Battle of Midway. And while they get the costuming and vehicles and planes and ships and all the rest of it right, uh, it's just too freaking busy. I mean, uh, scenes I saw in the trailer had, you know, like, you know, 20 planes in the air over a Japanese destroyer. And it's like, no, that, you know, no, it's not, it's not the uh, climactic scene of Return of the Jedi with a bazillion ships, you know, flying through the air. That's just not what it would have looked like. Plus, it all looked like CGI, um, you know, and I, it just doesn't do anything for me. Dunkirk, I did not see because I Christopher Nolan bores the hell out of me. Uh, I, I think he's he is the most overrated film director working today. Um, and I, everything I heard about this uh, movie said that it was like it, he, 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 he literally misses the point of Dunkirk. And he doesn't present you with any, like, relatable human characters that you can get involved with. It's, it's like a, a, an, an academic exercise into how to make a war movie rather than making a war movie with any kind of emotional heart. Sisu I did see, uh, and I really wanted to like it, but it just got so silly toward the end. It, it did what movies so many movies now do is they present the lead character as super heroic. Um, you know, th there were at least two dozen occasions in this film where this character simply would have died from the injuries he received, but yet he keeps moving, you know, sh through sheer willpower. And, you know, while I like a movie where it's the, you don't, as I said, the you don't know who you're messing with character and, uh, you know, a badass character, it just, it just seemed by the numbers and, and kind of stupid. Now, if you want to watch a bleak movie where uh, lots of bad things happen to Nazis, I suggest a movie called a recent movie called The Captain. Uh, this movie is freaking amazing. In fact, I'm, I'm going to watch it again tonight just because I'm talking about it now. Uh, it, it's shot in black and white. It's about a, um, a starving uh, German soldier traveling through... Um, I believe this, the same area Sisu happens in. Uh, he's, he's traveling across Europe while the, the Nazis are in retreat. Uh, and uh, he, he takes on the guise, he's, he's just a foot soldier, takes on the guise of a, um, of a captain, uh, army captain, Wehrmacht captain, in order to um, eat, get something to eat. And he continues the guise. And um, this kind of takes you on a kind of a Grand Canal tour of the final days of the Third Reich, seen through the eyes of this imposter, uh, as um, he's imbued with more and more power, the power that this rank gives him. And it's really an, an analogy about um, the, the rise of Nazism in Germany, and, and even more so about the, the uh, frailty of human nature how we will give in to the draw of absolute power. And uh, it's an amazing movie. And if, if you watch it, stay through the credits because the, the, the footage during the post credit sequence is absolutely chilling and drives the point of the movie home. So um, I highly recommend The Captain, which I believe is on... Uh, Amazon Prime. You can watch it for free if you have Amazon Prime. But definitely seek it out. But I warn you, not the feel-good movie of the year. <laughs> but then who would make a movie about, other than Mel Brooks, uh, a feel-good movie <laughs> about the last days of the Reich? Okay, Salazar Knight. I was wondering if you had talked about the transition period that the Batman books went through in the early 2000s when Denny O'Neill and his team stopped editing the Batman titles. 
I've read from various sources that the transition was problematic, to say the least. Since you were one of the few creators that remained after the changeover, I'd love to hear your perspective on the whole situation. Was it as problematic as it seems? And speaking of transition periods, would you tell us why the main creative teams on the Batman titles were completely replaced at the start of No Man's Land? It really seems to me like a very abrupt ending to three great runs by Alan Grant, Doug Mensch, and yourself. From what I've read online, it was another troublesome experience. Well, Denny O'Neill was our uh, group editor. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer your second question, or your second issue <laughs> first. Um, he was our group editor. He was the man who brought Batman back from, you know, campy land. Uh, took Batman back to his roots, and, and, and the main reason why we still regard Batman as a classic, terrific American icon today. Uh, because he rescued him from the um, the, the the taint. I, I hesitate to use the word taint. Um, the angle that the 1966 television show had, had put Batman in. So anyway, uh, he turns him back into a more serious, noirish, detective, tough guy character. And uh, he was our group editor. He was the man. He was the Batman. And uh, sales were dipping. It was um, the, the comic book gold rush of the early 1990s was over. And um, sales were slipping across the board. And everybody was looking to do something to uh, boost those sales up. And... Uh, we were doing, you know, one gimmick or stunt, as as Denny called it, after another. Uh, but each one was selling less than the last. So the writing was kind of on the wall, and they, they wanted to make a change. And, of course, as you mentioned, Alan Grant was writing Shadow of the Bat, as well as other Batman-related stuff. Doug Mensch, as well, was writing. Uh, he was the regular writer on Batman and, um, you know, doing other Batman related projects as well. And, uh, you know, basically we were the, the core. Um, I was writing detective. Doug was on Batman. Um, Alan was on shadow of the bat, a book book created for him, uh, to work on. And, uh, we've done real good for a while there. We sold a whole lot of comic books for DC and, uh, but you know, our, our day was coming to an end as, as sales began to, Fall apart. And so um, then he fired us by fax, famously fired us by fax machine. He did you know, he did it back to the future two style. <laughs> and it was funny because um, at this time I had an outside office. I had young kids at home and it was getting harder to work in my home office. So I rented an outside office and that's where my fax machine was. And on this day, I decided I, I, I was going to stay home. And, and just do do little do some work at home. Um, and Scott Peterson kept calling me, uh, Denny's uh, uh, associate editor, and saying, "You are you going to the office today? Are you going to the office?" <laughs> so finally, after like the third call, he said, "Look, you you need to go to the office today." I said, "Okay, all right. What's it about?" He wouldn't tell me. So I went to the office, and there was the facts informing me I was no longer going to be writing detective comics and um, my phone rang and I thought it was Scott to make sure that I got the uh, facts, but it was Doug. <laughs> Doug had spent much of the um, afternoon talking to Alan Grant and um, Doug literally said, are you going to come over to the dark side with us? <laughs> In other words, to start hating on Denny O'Neill. And I'm like, I, 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 I can't hate Denny. And Doug was like, yeah, but what a crappy way to fire us by fax machine. And I said, it's Denny. <laughs> Denny's like the shyest guy in the world. Denny was not a fan of any kind of confrontation. He, he, there was no way he was going to call us and fire us. Um, so he did it the next best thing he could. He, he fired us by fax machine. I said, this guy gave me, you know, the biggest break I ever had in comics. I'd gotten breaks before from Larry Hama and Dean Mullaney. Um, but this was the biggest break I'd ever gotten. And I can't, you know, I can't diss the guy. I can't dislike Denny O'Neill. The other thing, the unspoken thing from Doug was, is that I was only fired from Detective. Uh, I was not fired from Nightwing, 
Birds of Prey, uh, Green Arrow. So I still had three titles and would soon have a fourth. Um, so there it was very much the elephant in the room that Doug and Alan were fired, but I was still technically a Batman writer. I just wasn't writing detective. Uh, now, Scott Peterson confessed to me later that they didn't really want to fire me. Um, they wanted to give me the Batman title, but Denny didn't think that was fair. And that's Denny, too. Uh, Denny always tried. He shared the wealth. He shared the pain. And um, he thought it wasn't fair to keep me on a Batman title and fire the other guys. Uh, so just threw the baby out with the bathwater. Now, a few months later, Denny called to offer me the Batman title. Uh, this is probably six months to nine months later. He called, and would you like to be the regular Batman writer? And um, at the time, I had been back to write a few fill-ins and, and a couple of, like, two-issue arcs and stuff like that. But, but so had Doug and Alan. Uh, you know, they were brought back, like, as, as guest spots to write but he offered me the title regularly, and I said, uh, well, yeah, I, I would like it. And then he said, uh, it's between you and another writer. And I said, well, who's the other writer? And he said, Larry Hama. And I said, I can't take a job from Larry Hama. And he says, are you sure? And I said, no, I can't do it. I can't do it. Once again, guy gave me a big break in comics. I can't, I can't, I, I can't in good conscience take a job from Larry Hama. So uh, we, we hang up. Everything's cool. And once again, phone rings. It's Scott Peterson. <laughs> and he's yelling. Why didn't you? As in despair, not anger. Why didn't you take the job? Why didn't you take the job? And I'm like, because I would have been taking a job from Larry Hama. And <laughs> Scott says, but Scott McDaniel was going to be the artist on it. And I'm like, oh, man, Denny didn't mention that. <laughs> So I might have taken it if I knew that Scott McDaniel was going to be my artist, which would have been good for everyone because um, even Larry, because <clears throat> Larry and Scott were not a good mix. Uh, Larry didn't really like Scott's art that much. And Scott didn't really like Larry's scripts that much. So I think it would have been better overall if I had taken the title. Uh, I probably would have been on it for you know a couple more years. Um, uh, but that's not the way it went. So, so there's the reason for the abrupt ending. It's the simplest reason. It's the most common reason in comics, uh, until recently when earnings don't seem to matter. Uh, but the most common reason in comics once upon a time was, uh, you got canned because your sales went down. You know, it was, it was all based on merit, which I was fine with. Uh, and, uh, there you have it. Now, as far as after Denny retired, um, Denny retired and was replaced by editors who were, I always try to say, put it in the kindest terms, they were indifferent. Um, they weren't as driven, as motivated, as interested in producing quality work as Denny had been, Denny and his associates, uh, uh, Jordan and Scott and, and Darren, uh, were an awesome team who really wanted to make the best comics they could. And I think if you look at the period of their ages, they certainly did. Uh, they lived up to their job description. Um, but the, the editors who took over afterwards, and I, and, I, and I believe even some of the creators, were kind of indifferent to um, the quality of the stories, uh, quality of artwork. Uh, they, they seem more interested in inner office politics than producing good work. And consequently, I visited the DC offices less and less because I didn't, I simply didn't want to deal with these people. Uh, and it's largely the reason I left for CrossGen. Uh, that and the fact that um, I was, I, I, I definitely got the feeling that my group editor wished I would quit wished I would leave or get hit by a bus or something. He wanted rid of me, but couldn't justify it as hard as he tried to justify it, according to some uh, other people I knew who worked there. Um, to try to justify firing me, he couldn't because I, I was writing four titles that were selling pretty good, not, not breaking any records, but they were still profitable. Uh, but 
you know, so what what he did was he he blocked any new projects I might want to do. Just actively worked against me getting anything other than those four monthlies, and um, so I uh, I left for CrossGen. But yeah, it was problematic and troublesome. Those are two good words for that era. Ian Potash. Hi, Chuck. I was wondering if there's any comics you followed where a certain story or event made you stop reading. Well, let's go in the Wayback Machine. Um, <laughs> Avengers number 16. That far enough back for you? Um, I stopped reading the Avengers uh, when they changed the Avengers lineup. And I think basically what happened was uh, Kirby left the book. And uh, Stan thought, well, let's juice the book up with some new characters. You know, Hawkeye and Scarlet Witch and... Quicksilver, and I just had no interest in any of those characters. I thought, why? Why would you take a book that I look forward to every month because it had it had Thor and had Ant Man, it had Captain America, it had Iron Man, it occasionally had Namor and the Hulk. I mean, these were all my favorites. Why would you ditch that for? I still don't know why. Um, maybe one of you can answer that question. Why would they change the lineup of a winning book? I mean, look, they've got a new team, but up in the corner box, it's the old team. <laughs> and so I, I stopped reading Avengers at this point. I just lost all interest in the title. Uh, another one was uh, when I learned that uh, this was Steve Ditko's last issue of Spider-Man. I uh, lost all interest. This might not even be the last issue of Spider-Man, but when I read the last issue of Spider-Man and, and Stan has his, like, kiss off to Steve Ditko, you know, goodbye, uh, he's not going to be on this title anymore. I, I'm 11, 12 years old. There's no fandom. There's, I don't know what's going on behind the scenes at Marvel, but I do know that I know Steve Ditko. I know him through his work. I know that Spider-Man is something that closely associated with him, that he's put his heart and soul into this character. He's the reason Spider-Man exists. He's the reason Spider-Man works. How I know this, I don't know. I intuit it all. Of course, it's I'm entirely accurate. My intuition was right on the ball, uh, you know, right on the point. And I thought he would never leave this title unless somehow they had screwed my man Steve Ditko over. And um, that is essentially what happened. So I was right, and I stopped reading Spider-Man, and I boycotted Marvel for years. Uh, for years, I would not buy a Marvel comic. and um, But eventually, I caught up with it all because uh, in high school, a buddy of mine was selling his collection. And I bought all the issues I missed for a nickel apiece. <laughs> so I did, I did cave and go back. But, uh, you know... But yeah, I mean, uh, this made me stop reading Spider-Man for years. And when you're a kid, years are really long. <laughs> Luke Marone. Growing up, I was a big fan of Spider-Man, Superman, and The Flash. At the time, all of these characters were married, which even when I was eight years old didn't make me throw down a comic because I couldn't relate. To the contrary, I guess as a kid, I looked up to these heroes for handling that level of responsibility and commitment. Personally, I enjoy seeing my heroes grow and change and tackle new challenges in life. And I never understand the rationale that, say, Spider-Man suddenly became unrelatable because he was married. All of that to ask, do you agree that superheroes should be able to settle down? Or do you think that marriage ruins superhero storytelling? And, and Luke provides us with a little cartoon of his own, which is really cool. Uh, I, I love that shot of Spider-Man. with uh, He's just sort of letting the, the paunch go. Uh, so. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I, I stopped relating to Spider-Man when he became the cool kid at school. You know, him getting married, no, I could relate to that. Even, you know, well, I was married at the time, but, but even as a kid, I could relate to the characters getting married because my parents were married, um, you know, and, and, and characters on TV were married, you know. Um, and so I thought this is just, made the comics somehow more believable. Uh, the, the, you know, of course, there's Reed and, and Sue Richards. I, I thought that was cool. And uh, we even see them get married. And, of course, there's the Dibneys, elongated man and his wife, Sue, 
And when I was a kid reading uh, these, they kind of reminded me of the Thin Man mysteries, which I think they were supposed to remind me of. And, um, you know, I liked it. It was different. It was fresh. It was new. Uh, they, they had a mature adult relationship. And, and instead of the old boyfriend, girlfriend, you know, boy meets girl stuff that was going on in the other titles. And uh, it, it kind of made it different and more interesting. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, as long as you know how to write characters in a marriage, it's best to have been in a marriage to understand how all of that works. Um, you know, the dynamics, plus it adds complications to the story, which are welcome, you know, in, in the long form, periodical nature, the serial nature of comic book storytelling. You want those um, what they call soap opera elements, but they're complicating elements that make the uh, hero's life more challenging, more difficult. Um, and marriage makes makes life in some ways much better, but in other ways it can be difficult because marriage is work. You've got to work at a marriage. You just don't fall in love and ride off into the sunset. Um, you know, there's all kinds of issues that come up. Uh, people are different and you have to, you know, you have to compromise, settle down, find common ground, uh, make sacrifices uh, and, and do nice things for each other. And consider the other person before you consider yourself and all those other things. And that certainly, like you said, fits in with the superhero uh, ideal of, of, of the good guy. You know, uh, the guy who's going to do the right thing no matter how hard it is. So, yeah, I, I, I you know, I like it. I like the idea. Ace Mowick. On your last episode, you mentioned how, thanks to AI, any fool can write a comic book nowadays, but obviously not with a level of quality. I was curious on your thoughts of other tools that have made writing a lot easier, such as talk to text, or even writing converted into text with a tablet and stylus pen. Would you say these tools have made it easier for people who want to be writers, but have a hard time sitting down and typing it up? And do you use any of these tools and edit what you wrote? Uh, or do you stick to the tried and true method of typing it all out on a keyboard? Um, and I can't even type. I'm a still, I'm a hunt and peck guy. Uh, Stephen King's a hunt and peck guy and he's done. Okay. Um, I never learned to type. Um, uh, I used to write my stories longhand and, um, send them to a typist until she quit, uh, because I was sending her too much stuff. <laughs> it was too prolific. <laughs> she couldn't keep up. She couldn't couldn't stand the pressure, so she quit on me, and I had to go out and buy a word processor. It was back in the days when you know people didn't really write; there weren't really word programs for writing on a computer. So I had to go out and get a, a dedicated word processor, learn how to use it in a, in a few hours, and get right to work because I had deadlines. And as I said, hunt and pack. Um, it was a pain using a word processor; they were clunky and, and kludgy and stupid. And uh, I can't tell you how many times I wrote an entire script and then completely lost it. Um, and you would have to actually print it up and, and send it to the publisher. And, of course, we all know what, uh, you know, that, that printers were created by Satan. Uh, <laughs> or, or perhaps they were created by God to test us, but printers, yeah. Uh, so all the problems there. And then, you know, uh, the PC comes along and my nephew helped me buy a PC and showed me about the word processing program. And then I was off to the races. You know, word processing programs are fantastic. You can edit as you go along. You can move type, as, as we all know now. I mean, you can cut and paste. You can move stuff around. Rewriting is a breeze. Everything's so much easier. And um, so that's really the only tool I use. Now, as far as talk to text or uh, writing with a stylus, uh, I, I don't have any interest in doing that. Uh, now, people do it successfully, and this is uh, comes into my theory. Uh, well, no, I mean, it's not even a theory. It's a fact that every writer works differently. Every writer's mind works differently. And um, talk to text would not work for me. I would, be, I, I would be using a different part of my brain. Now, science has proven that we use a different part of our brain for the different functions of language. Uh, right now, I'm talking to you, I'm using one part of my brain. When I write, I'm using an entirely different one. When I read, I'm using an entirely different one. And when I'm listening, I use an entirely different one. We have all these different dictionaries in our mind. 
That's why when you're talking, you know, you, you're always searching for a, a word that would come easily to you if you're writing. Think about it. I mean, none of us speak as articulately. Our lexicon of our vocabulary is not as deep when we speak as it is when we write. And we can say, well, that's because speech is more casual. No, it's because when you're talking, your brain is searching through a different dictionary than when you write. And this has been proven, scientifically proven. Uh, why our brains work that way? No idea. Uh, but that's how they work. And that's why you're able to, um, I mean, from my own experience, writing, I can recall all these words. And now I've read my own work. I'll, look, I'll go back and idly just flip through something I've written a year later after I've written it. And I'm like, I didn't know I knew that word. <laughs> it's, but I obviously did because I wrote it, you know. So when I'm reading my own work, I'm using a different part of my brain than when I wrote the work. Is that is that freaky or what? So, yeah, I mean, different methods of writing. Um, I mean, dictating to someone, uh, talk to text, using a stylus, you know, whatever. Uh, if that works for you, that works for you because that's uh, that's how your brain operates. Ace again. I wasn't a fan of Fantastic Four growing up. The 2000s movie didn't give me a reason. <laughs> But I've finally gotten around to re reading the Kirby Lee FF regularly and have enjoyed it a lot. After Kirby left the title to go to DC, what do you think were some solid runs, story arcs on the comic? Every discussion page I've seen says Burns. and But what about before and after? There doesn't seem to be much after some point in the 90s. From what I can gather, thoughts on that as well. Um, yeah, when, when Jack left, he kind of took the Fantastic Four with him. He took the core of it with him and, and left Stan with really nothing to do except reuse characters that have been used before, uh, try to imitate Kirby's later attraction to using themes. Uh, there was like a 1950s themed villain <laughs> in early in Lee's run. Um, but what Kirby took with him was the idea, was, was the fact that when you bought the Fantastic Four, when you were a regular reader, you never knew what to expect from month to month. I mean, there was always new stuff being thrown at you, new concepts, new ideas, new dangers, new challenges. Uh, Kirby was just working overtime to um, to thrill and enthrall and and you know poke at your sense of wonder with with the Fantastic Four. Uh, basically, he was exploring his own uh, agile mind, his exploring the limits of his own imagination. Um, you know, things you get read about advances in science and stuff like that to uh, create the uh, the Fantastic Four stories. And when he left, you know, he took all that with him. And Stan was just left with these four characters that he had to get into zany adventures every month. And Stan pretty quickly hands the title off to other writers uh, who, you know, to one degree or another, yeah, they do. It's okay. I mean, Fantastic Four was consistently a, a decent comic to read. It just never got back to where uh, Jack had it. Now, Byrne comes along and sort of tries to recapture that magic. And, and in a lot of cases did. Uh, I read that. I, I avidly read Byrne's Fantastic Four run after not having read the title for years. Um, and I really enjoyed it. I just didn't... The, the thing I didn't like about it was um, uh, Byrne's... Um, nobody leave this room endings that he had to a lot of his stories where, you know, the end of the story was like three pages of Reed explaining stuff in really big word balloons, you know, panels crowded with words. Um, and I'm like, boy, Kirby would have put this across more elegantly, you know, with, with that excellent, you know, glistening Stan Lee dialogue. But, um, but, I, but I appreciate the effort. And he was on that. He was on FF for quite a long time. And like I say, at the time, I really, really enjoyed those stories, and I've reread a few recently, and they were fun. They were they were good efforts, um, but it had some of the problems I always have with burn stories. But um, and then you know, was, I think Simonson's run was rather forgettable. 
And then as much as, as much as I love Tom DeFalco, uh, Tom DeFalco and Paul Ryan's run was pretty, pretty unexceptional. Uh, I kind of think that Tom took on the Fantastic Four because believe it or not, uh, there are periods in Marvel's history where they had characters that no one wanted to write. And I think Tom wrote the Fantastic Four because no one else wanted to write it. Uh, believe it or not, in the 70s, when I used to go up and talk to Archie Goodwin when he was at Marvel about working at Marvel, uh, Archie admitted to me that no one wanted to write the Hulk and no one wanted to write Spider-Man. Uh, that they had to like basically twist people's arms, which is if you look at those titles is why they didn't have consistent writers for a long time. Uh, writing a Hulk and Spider-Man was kind of a punishment. And uh, I mean, Archie wrote Hulk and wrote some great Hulk for a long time simply because he couldn't get anybody else to do it. Uh, Archie even wrote some Spider-Man for a while because he just simply couldn't get anybody to do it and they needed the stories. So um, I, as much as I love DeFalco and Ron Friends' work on Thor, I think that he was kind of phoning it in on Fantastic Four. So yeah, there, after Kirby, there's not really, you know, other than Byrne, which I had a few problems with, as I said, um, there's really nothing to recommend Fantastic Four. Wayne's Comics, I continue to enjoy your shows via the YouTube. Uh, I threw in the... Uh, I also enjoy the audiobooks about Levon Cade. Was the 11th one the final one? I know you're busy with Conan and such. Um, no, I am currently writing the 12th Levon Cade book. It's called Levon Scourge. Uh, about three quarters of the way through it. I'm nearing the downslope. And um, it's an epic. It's going to be the longest uh, by page count Levon book yet. And it's, um, for you who are big Levon fans... It's all Levon. There's nothing about his family or anything else. It is Levon on the loose in the world uh, trying to straighten out the events. Events that began all the way back in, in, in book two, Levon's Night. He's finally going to take care of all that to keep his family safe. Or is he? <laughs> so uh, it's the, uh, the, the bloodiest, nastiest uh, Levon adventure yet. Uh, I told somebody recently, I've never had him this deep in crap before. And um, over the next few weeks, i got to work his way out of it to get this book out before the end of the year. So you can look forward to that. Levon Scourge, 12th book in the Levon Cade series of novels that I write. Story time. You all like that story I told last time about the, um, the busload of lunatics. Uh, let off at the Channel 6, WPVI-TV. So I thought I'd tell you another story, another adventure of my times working as a janitor <laughs> at, a, at an ABC affiliate in Philadelphia in the 70s. And this one is also educational because in it we will learn the difference between an alligator and a crocodile. Now, how did that happen at a, at a television station? Well, Every morning, every weekday morning on Channel 6 was the Captain Noah show. It came on really early. It was on before Good Morning America. So, so you woke up at the crack of dawn, and there was Captain Noah. And uh, his name was Carter Merbriar. And he and his wife, uh, on the show, she was Mrs. Noah. Uh, I mentioned Captain Noah briefly in the last story. Uh, Miss Elaine was the, uh, the, young, the young crew member, the first mate of, of Captain Noah's Ark. Uh, so anyway, he, he had an hour long show. Uh, it ran from the crack of dawn till good morning America started. And, uh, he would show cartoons, uh, Popeye, Bugs Bunny and Gumby. And he got great ratings. He was the last kid show, last man standing in the kid show business in, in Philadelphia. Uh, everyone else had gone over to other things. I don't, I don't think they were airing Captain Kangaroo anymore at this point. And um, so it was him, and he was the only uh, local uh, children's host. Uh, Happy the Clown, Sally the Star, Ranger Rex were long gone by this point. So it was this Captain Noah uh, holding the fort, the skipper of his own ship. Uh, now, in addition to the cartoons, uh, because the FCC demanded it, they would have educational uh, segments, uh, and, and every week a guy called Mr. Nature, this isn't him, but it's close enough, 
uh, Mr. Nature would come from the Philadelphia Natural History Museum, and he would, you know, teach the kid, would bring some animals to the ark, seems fitting, and he would uh, demonstrate for the kids, you know, different things about animals. So we would learn about birds and cats and whatever. Um, well, this week, he decided to bring along a couple of crocodilians. So he had an alligator. Uh, it was about the size of a, a house cat. And he, and he took it out of its box. <clears throat> and he held it up. <clears throat> and the alligator just sort of, bleh, just sort of, you know, was there, you know, sleepy because it was cold out. And uh, he was showing how you could turn it on its back and rub its tummy and it would fall asleep, which is true. If you can get an alligator, if, you, if you're ever fighting with an alligator, try to get it on its back. It, it will fall asleep or go into a trance or for whatever reason. Um, so the alligator is like, oh, you know, and, and, and Captain Noah is making remarks about the, the alligator and it's all kind of cute and everything. So he puts the alligator, again, about the size of a house cat, uh, back in its box. And then he says, now I'm going to show you how a crocodile is different. And he opens up a much smaller box. And out of it leaps, leaps an alligator about seven inches long. <laughs> it's a little baby alligator. It leaps out and it clamps its jaws on the web of Mr. Nature's right hand. <laughs> You know, where your thumb and your index finger meet right there, the web of your hand there. And it clamps on and it won't let go. And, <laughs> and Mr. Nature, I got a hand of this guy. I didn't have a lot of respect for this guy. I didn't think he was like a real manly dude, but he held it together, right? He must have been in the most intense pain because if you know anything about the, 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 uh, the foot pound uh, ratio pressure of a crocodile's bite, he, 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 this thing was crushing bone and it's there and it ain't letting go. And so he the staunch the blood flow and it was serious. He clamped his wrist between his knees. He formed like a tourniquet with his knees to stop the blood flow, which was spreading in a pool on the studio floor under him. <laughs> Captain Noah, veteran of live TV, totally unflappable. Says, I see what you mean. The crocodile appears to be much more active than the alligator. <laughs> While this guy's bleeding to death. Uh, so luckily, uh, there's an emergency room. There's a hospital right next door to Channel 6. And they take the guy over. Now, the crocodile's still attached. And um, so it's not until hours later that the, uh, the crewman... Uh, the, the, the TV camera crewman who took the guy over to the emergency room come back and they tell us that um, the, the croc broke the guy's hand, right? Didn't just bite him, broke his hand. And um, they had to inject the alligator with um, uh, sodium pentothal uh, to put it to sleep to make it release its grip because there, there was nothing was going to get those jaws apart. <laughs> And the next time we saw Mr. Nature, which was the next week, his arm was in a cast. I mean, that that sucker, you know, really damaged the poor guy. But it's still a funny story. Because <laughs> it's like, yeah, that's the difference between an alligator and a crocodile, which is a subject that's fascinated me since that day. Now, there's a sequel to this, or an epilogue. A few weeks later, I'm hanging out on the loading dock uh, at Channel 6. And a four-wheel drive pickup shows up. Now, this is late 70s. I'd never seen a four-wheel drive pickup. Big roll bar. And it's all beat up and battered. Looks like something out of, you know, you know, post-apocalyptic um, survivalist movie. And uh, it backs up. And this dude gets out of it. And he's basically a Native American version of Brock Sampson. I mean, this guy's huge. He's got these enormous arms. And um, enormous shoulders, and his and his forearms are covered in this like crisscrossed white scar tissue. And I'm like, wow, what? I mean, this this is a guy that if he, if he walked in the room, everybody would be looking at because he's just an impressive dude. And it turns out he's he a Seminole Indian. And he gets out, and he climbs up on the loading dock, and he says, you know, do you know where Studio C is? Captain Noah's studio. And I'm like, yeah. 
And he goes, could you help me bring this crate in? I'm in an orange jumpsuit, so, you know, I'm, a, I'm, I'm obviously a blue-collar guy. I'm there to work, right? And I said, crate? And he pulls this crate out of the back of the truck onto the loading dock, and it's just... It's this big wooden crate with rope handles on either side of it. I remember it was blue and it was battered. It looked like it had been all around the world, right? And um, real heavy, bolted together. And he says, help me carry this into the studio. I'm like, yeah, fine, right? So we're carrying it. It was heavy. We're carrying it in the studio. We're carrying it down the hall. And something inside is shifting around. <laughs> I'm like, hey, what's in here? And he goes, I'll show you when we get in the studio. So we get in the studio and this dude pulls out, he opens the end of it, pulls out a seven foot gator. And I'm like, holy crap. Right? And he goes, don't worry. He says, it's cold. This was the middle of winter. He says, I got it out of a pool uh, like an hour ago and uh, it's cold. So it's not going to be real active. And he says, how, how, how soon do I go on the show? I mean, what segment am I in? I said, I have no idea. And he goes, well, they better have me on early because once they get the, the show lights on, this thing's going to warm up, which is what happened. <laughs> Captain Noah had the, the gator on <clears throat> later in the show. And um, it's, it, it did a lot of damage with its tail to the arc. <laughs> But this guy was able to handle it. I mean, he was showing me his moves beforehand, you know, how he, he would cup the bottom of the jaw and stuff like that and explain that you can hold the jaws closed. Uh, you can't hold them open. He said, there's no way to hold them open because, of, uh, once again, the foot-pound pressure even of a gator. Uh, he says, but, but the jaw muscles for opening were very weak. And so you could hold, you know, with one hand, you could hold a, a, an alligator's jaws closed. A uh, good thing to know if you ever fall into the water with gators. Um, but the punchline of this story is, I said, hey, did you ever wrestle a crocodile? And the guy says, do I look crazy? <laughs> oh, God. So if you ever want to know anything more about the difference between alligators and crocodiles, please contact me at brunobookstore at gmail.com, brunobookstore at gmail.com. Send your questions like these fine folks, and they're excellent questions. You can send your questions here directly to me, or you can try to get around it like, like Bat Neil and send it through direct messaging. Uh, <laughs> but a lot of times I'll miss them. Uh, but I will never miss a question sent to Bruno Bookstore at gmail.com. And while I got you a uh, new Conan book, uh, Caravan of the Damned. It's my second in uh, of my Conan books. Third one's also written. But this one uh, is is either available now, it'll be available very soon from the from the good folks at Arkhaven, and uh, keep an eye out for it on Amazon. Uh, if if it has been released, if it gets released in the time between the time I've recorded this and the time that you see it, I will put the link in on links. So anyway, thanks for listening, thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing, thanks for liking, thanks for helping me spread the word, and I'll see you all down the road.